Hi, everyone. Welcome. Hello, hello. My name is Sarah Palmieri, and I am proud to be the Director of Programming and Marketing at the First Ontario Performing Arts Center in downtown St. Catharines. And we're so thrilled to be part of this very special event in partnership with the Niagara Folk Arts Multicultural Center. So welcome. We're here together tonight, and I encourage you all to share the stream and encourage conversation. Before we begin, I'd like to say that we are meeting tonight on a virtual platform, which offers an important moment for us to reground ourselves in this physical place. I ask you all take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the land which we each call home and the First Peoples, Indigenous, Métis and Inuit people of that place. The First Ontario Performing Arts Centre is in downtown St. Catharines, which is on the shared traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Neutral Peoples and many other Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And we offer our sincere gratitude and respect to the original and continued stewards of this land. I'd also like to acknowledge Indigenous, Black, people of color, 2S LGBTQQI plus people who have been marginalized for centuries and more, and our collective responsibility to take action to live in a better world free from oppression, racism, and discrimination. I'd like to now introduce our feared moderator for tonight, Pablo Rodriguez. Pablo is a graduate of Niagara College Social Service Worker Program. His professional background is in the developmental sector where he ignited his passion for dismantling barriers and creating more accessible and inclusive spaces for all. Pablo is a proud advocate of diversity, equity, inclusion, and representation. A local change maker, Pablo enjoys volunteering his time with Pride Niagara in support of 2S LGBTQQIA plus issues, lending his voice as a storyteller, public educator, and social justice champion in our community. In his role as anti-racism, anti-oppression facilitator at the Niagara Folk Arts Multicultural Center, Pablo delivers responsive programming that empowers newcomers with practical tools to address issues of exclusion, while also growing our community capacity to understand the needs and considerations of equity-seeking groups. As a former newcomer himself, Pablo passionately believes in the indispensable value of newcomers and hopes to empower, inspire, uplift equity-seeking groups in our Niagara community. Welcome, Pablo. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And hello, friends and allies, to our Black History Month and African Heritage Celebration entitled Transitions Through Time. My name is Paulo Rodriguez, and I have the immense pleasure of being your host this evening uh, for our programming. We have an amazing lineup prepared for you all tonight. But before we begin, I would like to acknowledge um, and reflect on why we have gathered here this evening. We recognize Canada's history uh, and Canada's Black history theme for 2022 is February and forever. As we celebrate Black history today and every day, and focus on recognizing the daily contributions that Black Canadians make to Canada. During the month of February, we acknowledge the role of Black Canadians and their communities in Canada have largely been ignored as a fundamental part of our Canadian history and heritage. Some here today may be aware that African people were once enslaved in Canada, but most importantly, may not know of those who have fought enslavement and their revolts resistance and resilience that has paved the way for a foundation of diversity in this country. Black history is Canadian history. Black history and African American and African Heritage Month is a time to celebrate the joy that is experiencing black culture and to learn more about these Canadian stories and the countless other meaningful contributions black people and black communities have made to the history and continued advancement of this country. This evening, we look to our history in order to pave the way for a different kind of future. We welcome you as we shift our focus from black trauma and suffrage to a celebration of our black community's strength and resilience. We proudly share our rich black cultural heritage 
and the significance of the physical place that we call home. Tonight, we gather to explore the experience of being Black and a woman in past and present day Niagara, as well as learn how concepts of freedom and liberation have evolved through the transitions of time. From past to present to future, transitions have been our constant. This African Heritage and Black History Month, we celebrate the opportunity, courage, and strength of past, present, and future generations of Black people, together united in solidarity, honoring our Black community's contribution to a strong, diverse, and prosperous Niagara. One last thing to note before we kick off this evening's event, we would like to acknowledge that the Niagara Folk Arts Multicultural Centre and the first Ontario Performing Arts Centre support open discussion, debate, and experiences. At the same time, we ask that individuals attending this event are respectful of diversity and the lived experience of our presenters. The organizers for this evening's event will intervene if there are comments that are racist, homophobic, transphobic, sexist, or ableist. Individuals who create a volatile environment will not be tolerated. Their comments will be deleted and they will be blocked from the live stream. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns regarding this evening's event, please feel free to reach out. My contact information will be provided below in the live stream comment section of tonight's programming. Now, without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our featured performing artist for this evening's event, Eve Adams. A Niagara-based performing artist who uses poetry, movement, and sound to tell stories. She is particularly interested in centering the voices of the margin and tapping into the universal experience of all beings. Her style fuses reggae, dub, and new age vibes with an edgy rawness that leans towards experimental. You can find a link to her audio and visual creations on her Instagram. We would also like to make an honorable mention to Diana, to Deanna and Marcel at Suitcase and Point for allowing us to utilize their studio space and to Zen Taylor for their camera work featured in this evening's performance. Eve's opening piece is entitled, Those Who've Gone Before a piece in homage to our ancestors. We hope you enjoy. Hey y'all, this is Eve Adams again, here with another song for you. This one is called Those Who've Gone Before and is inspired by this idea of transitions through time and space, and I hope you enjoy.
What an amazing homage from Eve Adams for those who have gone before. It is with a very joyful spirit and honor that I introduce to you all our first speaker of the night, Adrian Petrie. Adrian is a public historian and visitor, services coordinator at the St. Catharines Museum and Well and Canal Center. He holds a BA in history from Brock University and an MA in public history from Western University. Adrian has been practicing public history and heritage interpretation in heritage sites well over 15 years. Adrian will be sharing with us a bit about Niagara's rich black heritage and helping us recognize the historical significance of the physical place we call home. Take it away, Adrian. Good evening and thank you for inviting me to join tonight's event. The narrative we often share about the Underground Railroad tends to distinguish Canada as a place of freedom, opportunity, and tolerance from the United States, as a place where racism, discrimination, and slavery flourished. However, it is important to acknowledge that Canada has its own history of slavery and racism. During today's brief talk, I'll discuss the conditions which freedom seeker refugees traveling on the, on the Underground Railroad experienced here in St. Catharines, with special attention to the idea that many freedom seekers recognize themselves. Freedom from slavery is not freedom from racism. Some of the first people of color to live in Niagara were enslaved. As a colony of the British Empire, Upper Canada was involved in the trans transatlantic slave trade. As Europeans and Americans began to settle in Upper Canada, many families brought enslaved peoples with them. By the 1790s, uh, United Empire Loyalists, who migrated to Canada after the American Revolution, had brought over 2,000 enslaved peoples with them to Canada, between 500 and 700 in Upper Canada. One exception, locally, was a free Black man who settled in St. Catharines in the 1790s named Richard Pierpoint. Pierpoint is particularly famous due to his long-standing military service during the American Revolution and later during the War of 1812 at a considerably advanced age. Born in present-day Senegal around 1744, Pierpoint was captured at the age of 16 and forced into slavery. He was enslaved as a servant of a British officer and won his freedom after enlisting with the British during the American Revolution. Pierpoint was granted a parcel of land in Grantham Township, today known as St. Catharines, where he settled. Pierpoint's story is important and impressive, but we don't have time for the full narrative this evening. Though it is important to mention that Pierpoint was likely one of the only free Black people in St. Catharines when he lived here and would have known neighbors who were enslaved. The background to the arrival of freedom seeker refugees between 1820 and 1860 in St. Catharines is likely well known as it is similar to the Underground Railroad history for many Canadian cities and towns, including Owen Sound, Toronto, Chatham, and Windsor, as their communities were also known as a terminus on the Underground Railroad, just like St. Catharines. Despite the metaphorical name Underground Railroad and terminology used in the network, there was no actual underground tunnels or train tracks. Instead, freedom seekers escaped bondage traveling by means available to them on foot, using stagecoaches and real life railroads and boats and ships. The Underground Railroad developed over time to become a loose network of abolitionists and those concerned with the welfare of freedom seeker refugees. Some networks were highly organized. For example, Harriet Tubman using uh, St. Catharines as her base of operations, frequently traveled routes between Rochester and Syracuse on her way, way to Delaware and Maryland. Here in St. Catharines, she was supported by abolitionist Hiram Wilson, who was also known as the Station Master. In Rochester, she worked with Frederick Douglass, and in Syracuse, she worked with Jermaine Logan, who were also known as Stage Masters, Station Masters. Harry Tubman's life is very well documented, especially in comparison to others who achieved similar success in evacuating refugees from bondage on the Underground Railroad. We were particularly fond and proud of Tubman's story, of course, because she resided here in St. Catharines in the 1850s and participated in community while she was here, including her membership at the Salem Chapel British Methodist Episcopal Church. 
Tubman, born into bondage, escaped her slavery in Maryland. She arrived in St. Catharines in 1851, pushed from Philadelphia by the Fugitive Slave Act. Though she participated fully in community here, she personally felt unable to live fully without her friends and particularly her family who remained in bondage back home. She returned dozens of times and likely evacuated hundreds of enslaved peoples to freedom in Canada. While Tubman's story is important, it also it often overshadows the variety of experiences that other freedom seekers encountered on the rail on the, on the Underground Railroad. Indeed, many escaped with assistance from the network, but others made their way to Canada through their own fortitude and grit. The experiences of the Underground Railroad were particularly regional in nature. And while we tend to apply a homogeneous lens to the narrative, it's important to recognize the distinct differences in the risks and challenges encountered by those laying their lives on the line to get to freedom. Freedom seekers began traveling to Upper Canada after the legislature passed an act to prevent the further introduction of slaves and to limit the contract for suvertude in 1793. While the act didn't abolish slavery, it did ban the further importation of enslaved Africans and was the first signal for enslaved peoples in the United States to begin to contemplate escaping to Canada. The act became a beacon, inadvertently encouraging freedom seekers to make the journey. Later, the imperial government, pressured by, growing, uh, by the growing movement of British abolitionists, introduced the Emancipation Act, or an act to uh, for the abolition of slavery, which was passed in 1833 and came into effect on August 1st, 1834. The act freed enslaved peoples throughout the British Empire, including here in Canada, and served as an even brighter beacon for freedom seekers escaping enslavement. Finally, an additional pressure pushed many freedom seekers further no north into Canada. Some, like Harriet Tubman, had only originally gone as far as the free states in the north. So when the Congress of the United States passed the second Fugitive Slave Act in 1850, which allowed bounty hunters to cross state boundaries in pursuit of freedom seekers, many freedom seekers resu resumed their journey into Canada. Bounty, bounty hunting activity was illegal in Canada, where the law also didn't apply, and many freedom seekers felt that the only safe haven was on the other side of the border. A Black community in St. Catharines had long been established well before the Emancipation Act and the Fugitive Slave Act, as I mentioned previously. Richard Pierpoint is considered the first Black settler in St. Catharines, but many free and enslaved Black people helped the community to grow in significant ways. For example, the Salem Chapel, British Methodist Episcopal Church, was founded in 1835, and the Zion Baptist Church was founded in 1838. These places of worship quickly became hubs for social activity and organization for assisting newly arrived freedom seekers. But why St. Catharines? Most historians credit the Welling Canal, the most important transportation route in North America between 1840 and 1860, as the great attractor for not only freedom seekers, but many waves of immigration arriving to St. Catharines. Its status as a major urban center, the fifth largest urban center in Canada West at the time, and its proximity to the United States also made it a very simple, easy, and practical solution for freedom seekers and abolitionists to organize and stage return trips on the Underground Railroad. It is, was well known and advertised too that St. Catharines was a place of plenty. Agriculture, milling, manufacturing, and shipbuilding brought considerable wealth to the city between 1840 and 1870, and there was plenty of opportunity still William Wells Brown, Benjamin Drew, and Samuel Gridley Howe wrote about the opportunities and life, including property ownership, available to freedom seekers on arrival. The plethora of industrial activity along, with, along the Welling Canal certainly put St. Catharines on the radar of both freedom seekers and abolitionists. And over time, and with the publication and advertisement, St. Catharines became a hub, not just a terminus, for the Underground Railroad organization and abolitionist activities. The community, like most on the Underground Railroad, was prepared for the arrival of freedom seekers and made efforts to assist them in settling in town. 
The Refugee Slaves Friends Society was founded on April 16, 1852 by Reverend Hiram Wilson with support of local merchants and politicians, including Mayor Elias Smith Adams and our local member of provincial parliament, William Hamilton Merritt. Harriet Tubman was made an honorary member. The committee, along with various other societal organizations, helped direct funding to freedom seekers, organized land sales, and generally encouraged the town to welcome new arrivals. The community that newly arrived freedom seekers would have found on their arrival in the 1850s was a bustling community of settled formerly enslaved peoples in a place known as Colored Town. It was the general urban area around North Street and Geneva Street at that time, the outskirts of downtown. While refugees were actively settled away from the wealthy merchant class of the city, the congregation of settlement was more particularly and practically uh, related to the availability, availability of land which, uh, which the society had organized for their purchase and settlement. On a visit to St. Catharines in the mid to late 1840s, William Wells Brown recorded a description of the settlement. The colored settlement is a hamlet situated on the outskirts of the village and contains about 100 houses, 40 of which lie on North Street, the Broadway of the place. The houses are chiefly cottages with three to six rooms on and on lots of land nearly a quarter of an acre each. Each family has a good garden, well filled with vegetables, ducks, chickens, and a pig pen with at least one fat grunter getting ready for Christmas. The houses with lots upon which they stand are worth upon an uh, average of about $500 each. The houses in the settlement are all owned by their occupants and from inquiry, I learned that the people were generally free from debt. Out of 800 in St. Catharines, about 700 of them are fugitive slaves. Among them, I found 17 carpenters, four blacksmiths, six coopers, and five shoemakers. Two omnibuses and two hacks are driven by colored men. Brown's description is quite lovely. However, it doesn't quite show us the full picture. Along with William Wells Brown, William Still, Benjamin Drew, and Samuel Gridley Howe came to St. Catharines between 1840 and 1863 to interview and record the condition of formerly enslaved peoples as they had settled here. Most of their published works paint a rosy picture of life in St. Catharines. For example, Benjamin Drew's 1856 publication of The Refugee was written in direct response to, to other pro-slavery publications. The most interesting and perhaps forthright interviews come from the transcripts of Howe's interviews, which he took on his visit here in 1863. Samuel Gridley Howe was a member of the Freedmen's in Inquiry Commission and with his fellow commissioners traveled throughout North America, investigating the health and well-being of formerly enslaved peoples. The transcripts reveal the kind of general well-being but racial prejudice that the Black community faced here in St. Catharines. I wish we had time to explore the entire report and interviews. While I will share a few today, we have explored this topic at great length in the museum lecture series and on our blog here at the museum, which you can dig into after tonight's presentation. One of the most telling interviews was with Mrs. Brown. I find more prejudice here than I did in New York State. When I was at home, I could go anywhere, but here, my goodness, you get an insult on every side. The colored people have their rights before the law. This is the only thing that has kept me here. The law will project, protect my husband. I have always been free. Mr. Thomas Liker also, uh, Likers also confirmed. There is as much prejudice against the, uh, the black man in Canada as there is in the States. And I have sometimes thought more but the law makes no difference between black and white. If it had not been for that, I would not have gone to Canada. If a man spits on us and insults us, we knock him down and the law treats us fairly. We cannot do that in the United States. J.W. Lindsay also shared his perspective on the, on the idea of freedom from slavery is not freedom from racism and confirms that the opportunity in the promised land is not available to everyone. I find prejudice here the same as in the States. In this country, they will treat us as having been in slavery. They take hold of it as a handle to throw their stigmas upon us. 
I have been here 30 years. I have never seen a scholar made here amongst the colored people. There are two railroads. There is a canal where there are about 300 hands employed, and you won't see a colored face at either of them. The white folks don't give them any chance at all. Some established white business owners were welcoming to refugees and found them to be excellent workers, but only in comparison to other groups like the Irish, which were also victim to prejudice at this time. Eliza Stevenson, no, uh, owner of the famous Stevenson House Hotel, Salt Spring Spa, was clear. As a body, the colored people are very tidy and cleanly. They are not quarrelsome, but good-natured people and very temperate as a body. I think the country would be worse off if they were all taken away. We want them very much. I employ 50 through the summer. I prefer them to the Irish, as you can tell, or I would not employ them. Throughout his lengthy interview, however, Stevenson makes clear that he preferred to employ formerly enslaved peoples because they were better behaved than the Irish, who had the unfortunate and famous record of rioting on the Welland Canal construction site in the 1840s. This meant that their welcome in St. Catharines was conditional on their good behavior and even their performance in white society by white standards. They were clearly held to a much higher standard and over decades, this cemented itself into society. In 1852, the wait staff at the three big Salt Spring hotels, which by the way, were major tourist attractions for folks from all over the United States, including Mary Todd Lincoln, walked off the job in protest due to a rule that said black people were not allowed to ride inside hotel cabs and had to sit outside in the elements. The wait staff were mostly formerly enslaved people and were vital to operating the lucrative hotel businesses. At great risk to the waiters, the strike was successful, but the community's patience for them was incredibly limited. Their interaction with the government too was modified based on systemic racism. The last example I'll give from the Howe Report interviews is testimony provided by town clerk C.P. Camp. The colored people here get on very poorly. They steal our sheep, our chickens, and everything else. They are a curse to any country. I wish they were all back south for my part. They are a lazy set, especially the young men. We, uh, we have to support them while they live and bury them when they die. We have some Irish laborers. I don't know that the colored people are any worse than the Irish are. Having explored the history of the Underground Railroad in St. Catharines and from hearing from the refugees themselves, I hope that your own perspective of the narrative surrounding this important history has shifted. While formerly enslaved peoples were quite welcome here in St. Catharines and were met with assistance, opportunity, employment, community, and even land ownership, the freedom they enjoyed was not free from racism, racial prejudice, and systemic racism. From the early settlement and free, uh, of free and enslaved peoples of color to the dramatic arrival of refugees on the Underground Railroad, their story is one of struggle and success, tragedy and loss, and opportunity and hope. But from all historical material, it's clear that the experience of freedom seekers in St. Catharines was one of endurance. Most freedom seekers shared that they would prefer to be at home in the United States with their families, but that they would endure any conditions because Canada was where they were free. Indeed, after the Emancipation Proclamation, many returned home. They knew firsthand that freedom was not freedom from racism, freedom from slavery was not freedom from racism. So why stay during that time? I think Harriet Tubman said it best in her interview with Benjamin Drew. I grew up like a neglected weed ignorant of liberty, having no experience of it. Then I was not happy or contented. Every time I saw a white man, I was afraid of being carried away. I had two sisters carried away in a chain gang. One of them left two children. We were always uneasy. Now I've been free. I know what a dreadful condition slavery is. I have seen hundreds of escaped slaves, but I never saw one who was willing to go back and be a slave. 
I have no opportunity to see my friends in my native land. We would rather stay in our native land if we could be as free as free there as we are here. I think slavery is the next thing to hell. If a person would send another person into bondage, he would, it appears to me, to, uh, to me, be bad enough to send him into hell if he could. Despite enduring racial prejudice on a daily basis from individuals and institutions, refugees were able to build significant community with a proud and lasting legacy that reaches our collective identity as a community today, as Black history is Canadian history. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Adrian, for sharing those amazing stories um, of our Black history here in Canada and, and in Niagara and, and really enlightening us all with a historical picture of, of some true meanings of freedom and liberation. Now, up next, we have another performance by Eve Adams entitled Dark Horse, an epic poem about Richard Pierpoint, a freed Black man fighting in the colored corpse on the side of the British in the War of 1812. We offer a special thank you to the Niagara Falls Mil Military Museum and the Niagara Falls History Museum for the images and videos featured in this piece. Please enjoy. This poem is called Dark Horse. In the year 1812, when the South was sour, hostility reeked and the land devoured, an enemy hungry for wealth and power threatened the peace that was almost ours. Some of us free men and others soon would be brought to this land of the tamarack tree, remembered our foul-fated captivity, vowed never again to be our destiny. So one of our strongest, most wisest men sought the audience of Brock and his regiment to offer our service to fight for this land, to prove our worth and our freedom defend. Though he was old, Richard Pierpoint was fearless, could take a man down with one slice of his cutlass. His mind was sharp and his aim was faultless, and he walked in the way of the true and the righteous. Stolen from his homeland across the ocean, he escaped from slavery, evading persecution by fighting for the British in the American Revolution. He was given a new home here for his contribution. When Brock realized that he needed our aid, a special corps of colored men was made to arrest those Yankees who meant to invade and in these efforts be handsomely paid. We were promised our liberty, the prospect of land, but rather than granting Pure Point the command, we'd be led by Ramchi, a troublesome man. He was white and a worthless malcontent. He hired us out as servants and chattel, doing not to prepare us for impending battle. His leadership weak, his confidence fragile, but our spirits were strong and our bodies were agile. Eternal Cap Dick was our true guiding light with an incomparable soul and an ageless might, inspired in us a fiery will to fight for a better tomorrow, a future bright. He told us the story of when he was young, recounting his life in the Bondu sun, where his people would dance to the beat of the drum, where no man was slave, where all man was one. And when he described that beautiful past, off his bold brow a shadow was cast, his vision lost in worlds none could grasp, a black hole of needing, of wanting that back. But soon the horn blew, the time had come, for men to march on towards Queenston. Cap Pierpoint would stand while Ramchi would run like the coward we knew he was destined to become. We met our native brothers on the heights by the river with muskets and axes, bow and arrows and quiver. They knew the land well and through trees they would slither, squeezing life out with the death blows they delivered. We stood side by side in mutual respect, recognizing in each other what little we had left. So we smoked from the pipe and vowed to protect the seed of a dream of freedom we both might possess. 
Eternal cap rose to water that seed with an air of fine wisdom and elegant ease. He spoke of glory and valor and the days we'd be free, hanging on to each word we could hardly breathe. We felt it in our chest. We began to believe we could claim that win. We would have victory, not for the king, but for our own dream. We would not be defeated. We would never retreat. There the enemy approached, crossed the river, up cliffs. Our enduring pure point had let us equipped. Hearts set ablaze with determination and grit. With tumult and fury, our attack was swift. Blood splattered our shirts, thick smoke in our eyes. We did not fall back, could not compromise. Underestimating our strength would be their demise as we unleashed the wrath of our sacrifice. When they saw the steel that hardened our faces, they fell back in terror as failures disgraced and bitter sweet juices we finally tasted and we fell as brothers into each other's embrace. That day was for us, the native, the black man, and even the white man did clasp our hand. We knew that day forward transformed was our plan, that we achieve success, that we claim our land. Peer Point alone stood apart from the scrum. His everlasting light had faded some. He still longed for home and the beat of the drum and the whisper of freedom on the rays of the sinking sun. What a profound poem to speak to the blood, sweat, sacrifice, soul, and spirit of the courageous black men who stood and fought for the values of this country, our peace, our presence, and all only for a fleeting promise of freedom and liberation. This, peaks, this piece truly speaks to how much we can achieve when we come together. Now it is my privilege and my honor to introduce our next speaker, Sherry Darlene. She is the founder of Justice for Black Lives, who on June 6, 2020, organized the peaceful demonstration in which thousands marched in solidarity. Sherry is an authentic speaker who is impeccably intentional in her approach to break the barriers of systemic racism. Using methods that focus directly on dismantling ignorance, her let's stop pretending we don't see the elephant in the room approach is refreshing. Sherry Darlene has commissioned and worked to develop Niagara's first anti-racism committee where she sits as chair and was named Niagara's hometown hero in 2020. With this in mind, Sherry will be having a conversation with me this evening on our present and her experience as a black woman in Niagara today. Welcome Sherry, we're so happy to have you. Sorry, I had okay? to take myself off of mute. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thank you very much for having me. We're very happy that you're here. Um, Sherry, I know that you've made tremendous strides within the anti-racism space here in Niagara. I'm wondering if you could take us back a little bit and share with us what your call to action was uh, in this work. Um, if I had to be 100% honest with you, I'd, I'd have to say that um, I was activated at a very young age, and that was probably school age, that first uh, kindergarten grade one where I didn't know what it was. I just knew I was being treated differently. And I think my mother just kind of spared us from the reality of our situation, spared telling us about it, uh, the depth of it until right. again, we started to notice it. Right. So it, um, it wasn't until grade, I think it was grade one or two where um, they played roots. And I remember like, like only me, my brother, and my sister were the only black kids in the whole school. So I remember seeing this, just the first episode of Roots and like very, being very confused <laughs> and going home and asking my mother, like telling my mother, this is what they showed me. And my mother was very, very upset. And I later heard her phone, you know, telephone the school. And I didn't really get the whole conversation, but she was not happy about it. And this is when she did sit us down and kind of explain to us what that was all about. And still at a young age, I still, I guess my, my innocence couldn't comprehend 
um, that it was the world. It was like how things were for people who looked like me and her and my brother, I thought it was just in Niagara Falls. Right. So when I grasp the reality, like, no, it's not just Niagara Falls. This is how it is for black people. And I just remember saying to any adult who acknowledged it in my life, which was all the people in my family, like it was just, that's how it is. It's unfortunate. It's unfair. That's how it is. I just remember never being okay with it. Never, never being okay with this is how it is. This is just what we have to accept. This is, you know, it'll slowly get better. I remember even as a young child, just never ever being okay with it. And um, I guess the only difference between now and um, June 6th or how I've always been is that I had a microphone in my hand. So the, the people who know me, they were not surprised to see me up there on that train bridge at all because I've always been very vocal because it's been so transparent. <laughs> like, I mean, it's, they, they're not trying to hide it. They're, they're taking our, our lives. Our black bodies don't matter. They, they haven't mattered. And it's very clear. So at what point are we going to sit down and talk about this and figure out how we fix this or, or even start? And I, I found that you can't even have these conversations. These are taboo conversations. They're definitely you know, yeah. often end in debating and, and nothing gets done. So um, I'd say in my adult life, Ahmad Aubrey, like I guess it probably just really the itch started, the flame started with it's always been there, but then Trayvon Martin. And it was again, we know exactly what it was. We know exactly why it happened. Why are we debating this? Why is there you know, one side to this, you know, so many different sides to this when at the end of the day, we know what it was. We know why this young man lost his life, but we're going to hear the yeah buts. And then Michael Brown and then Ahmaud Aubrey really, really, really broke my heart as a mother. My son is 25. My son jogs every day. So I I made the fatal mistake of watching the Ahmad Aubrey video in like, no, it's broad daylight. And these men hunted him. They hunted him down. He tried to get away. They cut him off that, you know, they did. And it was so blatant. And then to hear that this happened months ago and we're just now seeing the video and had the video not been released. I don't believe any of these men would have went to trial. And when you look at the details of the case, how law enforcement went to extreme measures to cover this up, to make law, you know, make up lies. And it just, I, it, I was enraged. I tell you, Pablo, I could not leave my house for four days because I just would have, I would have went out into society and I wouldn't have conducted myself fair, fairly. People wouldn't have got, you know, a logical individual. I was so like rage. It was right. just pure rage and i think it was justifiable but i don't have the right to go out and hurt other people because i'm tired of watching black bodies get hurt and then george floyd happened i never watched the video but it was literally like a week after the ahmaud arbery and yes. i just remember my heart was so weary just tears i, I muted the tv because i couldn't watch the video and i heard you know you know everybody on the news he was crying for his mother and i just and i just sat at the ed edge of my bed and I, I like, I cannot sit idle anymore. I have to do something. And that's, you know, I've always used music. And three weeks prior to that, my brother had sent me a song and I'm a lyric person. And the lyrics were speaking to me. And it was, you know, I need somebody to come and free my people, to feed my people, help my people. And that song was playing in my head along with, just like if somebody doesn't stand up and say something, what's from them? I, I feel like the next step is them just kicking in our doors like they used to and taking our babies. And right. it, 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 like, I think I felt like we were just going backwards, backwards, backwards. Like at what point are we going to say this, say what it is, which is it's modern day lynching, you know? Yes. So that, that was actually what called me. And this is how I'm here today. Justice for black lives. And we're so happy that you are, and that it is an unfortunate story, but that you really are making a difference in our community and advocating mm -hmm. for these issues. It's absolutely so important. And I guess what I'd like to know as well is, 
obviously you're a black woman and you live in Niagara. Where do you see challenges for our black community and where do you see opportunities as well? I think um, my, my being a black woman in Niagara Falls, um, I've got a love hate relationship with Niagara. Niagara is my home and I love it, but it has rejected me every step of my life, every step of the way. Niagara has rejected me and my blackness has rejected my son and his blackness. It's painful. Um, sometimes, you know, we live in such a beautiful place. We have beautiful parks and, you know, Niagara is a beautiful place, but I don't feel like it, it, it Niagara lets me know on a regular basis. We don't want you here and you're not supposed to be here go away. So, I have to tell you June 6th, not even June 6th, June 7th, June 7th, which was the day after I, I, it was like a love letter from the Niagara community to me because I had given up on Niagara and the community I live in and grew up in. I had given up on this place. I have, you know, other black people were coming to me telling me their horror stories about living in that like we thought we were going to move here and retire here and things were going to be great and i feel like i stepped back in the 1950s and i don't think people realize just how bad it is here in niagara and i i, I want to say at the same time how very proud i am of niagara because june 6 like i said was a love letter that i needed to receive from my community i needed niagara to respond because i couldn't have in my wildest dreams imagine that I, all those people would have came out and stood side by side with me and and had the exact same thought, enough is enough. And especially not from the community who had caused so much of my black pain uh, and right. rejected my blackness. So it was refreshing. And I think the challenges today is really getting our older community here in Niagara Falls to, yeah, they're, 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 they're kind of stuck. They're, I can't, is really getting to them. And even if we can't get to them, then they have to be a little more tolerant because there's really no room. And this is my message for justice for black lives. There's no room anymore. You cannot be our police officers. You cannot be our school teachers. You cannot be our politicians. You, if you wanna be racist and you don't like people because of the color of their skin or their, their gender, their sexual orientation, you gotta keep that at home. That's where you're allowed to have that inside your house. That is your God given right. But you cannot go into the community and be the deciding factor where you could take someone's life. Um, you could be the determining factor on how far they go education wise. It's not fair. It's unjust. And I am unapologetically coming for every single person who thinks that they can sit on these mantles and conduct themselves as so. Definitely. I completely agree. Um, I don't think that these people should be in positions of power and decide over vulnerable populations. So I'm so glad that you mentioned that um, in today's chat. Um, but you did mention that June 6 was kind of a love letter to you. And we've recognized and identified that we also have so many allies here in Niagara. Um, for those of those, for those people who are just starting, um, do you have any suggestions for what they can do? Uh, where can they start and what resources are available to them? I do. What, what I have really um, focused on where I see a, a, the need is Justice for Black Lives uh, is my Justice for book, uh, to Black Lives book club. Um, the book selections that I choose are very intentional because I feel like there, there's a gap between that person who wants to stand beside me, be an ally, and the comprehension of the depth of the issue. So there's this gap there where I need you to first comprehend what you're stepping out into, what you're committing yourself to, because I don't think the average ally really understands. And I don't think they understand the depth. I think you need to pick up some books, join a book club. Um, I encourage everybody who wants to take on this path I encourage them to pick up Robin D'Angelo's White Fragility, Layla um, Sad's Me and White Supremacy, um, White Rage, uh, Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People. 
read, you have to comprehend. And these just scratch the surface and they really, really give you an idea of what they're dealing with. You're not just dealing with, you know, poor Sherry who can't walk her dog down the street without being called a nigger. It, it goes so much deeper in that and it's in every facet of every system. So I encourage anybody who wants to take this on, uh, you got to do your work, do your work, educate yourself, read, and then you pick your cause because there's fires everywhere. You pick if it's education, if it's uh, the criminal code, if it's policing, if it's the workforce, there is injustices for people of color in our BIPOC community in every realm of every system. It, uh, has been designed like that. Absolutely. And I cannot stress that. Um, you have to have thick skin. Right. You have to, as a white person going out into the world and advocating for fairness for BIPOC, you have to have thick skin. You are going to, it's going to be heartbreaking work for you because there's going to be people who you love who are close to you and they're going to break your heart because they're not going to want to meet you. They're not going to get it. They're not going to comprehend. And you have to be okay with that as well. Definitely. I couldn't agree more, Sherry. I believe knowledge is power. And what you're doing today and sharing this message is such an inspiring thing. And we're so happy to have you today. You. Um, how can others connect with you and your work? Where can we find you? Um, I am justiceforblacklives.com. Um, the emails from there comes directly to me. So I receive them directly. Uh, Facebook, I'm Sherry Darlene on Facebook. There's also Justice for Black Lives uh, Facebook. Um, there's a contact number on justiceforblacklives.com. Remember, it's justice, the number four, blacklives.com, all one word. Um, Instagram, Justice for Black Lives Niagara, we're there. We've been a little slow to start because COVID really had our hands tied. But now that hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, it's in the rear view mirror. We have some really great things coming up. And I feel like we're really, really going to challenge these barriers. Like, I need my armies. I need my soldiers. I, I have your armor. I'm going to hook you up real good. I'm going to equip you with your armor. And you know, let's go out there and make a difference and move the needle for change. That's the only thing left to do at this point, right? Absolutely. That's all the time we have left uh, for today for our section, Sherry. But I just want to say thank you so much for your time and for the work that you do. And it's been an honor having this chat with you today. Thank you. Thank you. Love your shirt, Pablo, too. Have a good <laughs> night, guys. Thank you so much. Bye. Up next, uh, please enjoy a featured presentation by Eve Adams entitled Subterranean Sky, and inspired by the lost cosmonaut recordings. This piece describes the feeling of powerness, powerlessness, and alienation often experienced by people of color. Please enjoy. Hey everyone, Eve Adams here. I'm about to perform a song called Subterranean Sky. It appears on the lost and found mixtape put out by Suitcase and Point. So check it out. Oh, I'm so 
Thank you, Eve, for showing us a very powerful, vulnerable, and interesting take on the feelings of alienation many people of color too often face. Up next, I have the absolute privilege to welcome our last and final speaker of this evening, Eve Niambia. Starting as a gender and sexual violence peer-to-peer -peer team member, Eve has become a strong voice in the broad community. Eve is now the interim anti-racism and inclusion advisor at Brock Human Rights and Equity, where she coordinates workshops, trainings, and events that educate students, staff, and faculty about anti-racism and inclusion through an intersectional anti-oppressive lens. She also undertakes a supportive role in handling, intaking disclosures and reports regarding racism and racial harassment. Eve is here to speak to us about Black future, her experience as a young Black leader, and where she envisions our celebrations of Black history and African heritage will take us in the future. Welcome, Eve. I'm so happy to have you here this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much. So, Eve, we've seen a few similarities between the critical work you do and the critical work that Sherry's been doing in our community. And, of course, some contrasts as well. Could you share a little bit about your experience growing up as a young Black woman in Niagara almost two decades after Sherry? You were Sherry's definition of a future. What do you feel has changed and what do you think has still remained the same? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, listening to Sherry's experiences, um, you know, I think this would be probably a better way to answer the question, but listening to Sherry's experiences actually brought back some memories um, for me in terms of how um, how I grew up in the Niagara region and the type of racism that I have also faced. And, you know, similar to her experience, um, hearing those stories, being a young child, you know, I didn't, I didn't know it was racism. I didn't know, I didn't really know what, what it was, you know, and now that I'm old, I've realized, oh yeah, that's racism. Oh, that's microaggressions. That's prejudice. You know, but back then I just didn't feel great. I was like, you know, that's kind of me. And I didn't like how they excluded me on the playground or, you know, um, I didn't like how I didn't realize that I was being followed around in a store. You know what I mean? Like just yeah. kind of those experiences, you know, I couldn't put a word to it, but it didn't make me feel good. So uh, it was definitely really similar in that sense that, you know, even though as a child, I wasn't really, I, didn't, I couldn't really put a name to it, but I just knew that something wasn't right and that, that, that something was wrong. Um, so that's definitely some similarities there growing up. And I think uh, even so, just kind of continuing on, like the Niagara region, you know, I, growing up here uh, for the bulk, for bulk of my life, I wasn't always here, but, you know, growing up, growing up here for the bulk of my life, um, you know, I think there's a lot of similarities. Um, there's still a lot of education that needs to be done and a lot of learning that needs to be done in the Niagara region. And, you know, I'm not that old, I guess. I'm still 23 years old. So um, to, to, I do think that even though lots of, I'll bring up the changes soon, but I think in terms of things that remain the same is definitely um, an ongoing ignorance and, and ongoing um, microaggressions that have occurred um, that still keep occurring in this time. So when people think about microaggressions, you know, they're very subtle slight remarks. So they're so subtle that people don't even realize that they're offensive or that they're even harmful until you kind of sit back after the interaction and you're like, oh, you know, wait, did this person really just, did this person say that they're surprised that I, that I got an A plus on this test or something, you know, like someone said that I, they're surprised, like, wait, do they think I'm not smart? Like, <laughs> you know, well, hold on, like you're kind of rewinding the interaction in your head. So um, definitely the, these types of feelings still remain. But I think for me, what has changed 
you know, is really, at least for me, from my perspective, um, I still have a long way to go in this world. So I'm sure I'll be seeing more changes going on. But I think one thing for me um, is really seeing the amount of work that people have been doing in our community. And this is an ongoing thing anyhow. You know, we've had people like Lola Morrison and, and Helen Smith um, that have been very prominent members in the St. Catherine Niagara region that have worked hard to preserve our history. So it's not like, you know, people in the past haven't been doing the work. Um, I think really, I think that can even argue something that's changed this, that stayed the same is that people have, are still continuing to do the work and are still trying to fight racism because racism is still happening. So um, I guess in terms of what has changed is that, you know, it's just, there's more younger people obviously taking the charge because they're still experiencing racism. So there's new faces, but the issues are still the same. Right. I totally hear. I think that there's so many things that have still kind of transgress throughout time and generations and are still here and they're embedded in, in our systems and in our experiences um, and the experiences of our black community um, but there are also we see like this this black renaissance and this renaissance of this anti-racism work which is so inspiring as young people take on the torch of this work um, with that being said eve how do you envision these celebrations around african heritage and black History Month will kind of change and morph and evolve in the future. Yeah, you know, honestly, I think, honestly, the way that I see it, I really, you know, hopefully it's changed now. This actually kind of relates back to the, the first question too, actually, is one thing that I hope that, you know, how I envision we continue to celebrate African Heritage and Black History Month is also seeing it more in schools. Um, like I said, I'm 23 years old, so it's not like it's been a while since I've been in elementary school and in high school. But when I was there, you know, in the 2010s years, I don't recall having a unit on Black History Month. I don't recall there being having there be actual legitimate celebrations, you know, or at least devoting time, you know, in our coursework to talk about Black history in the Niagara region. You know, it wasn't until about five years ago that, you know, I realized like, oh my goodness, Harriet Tubman actually lived here. Like I didn't even know that she lived in St. Catharines, you know, right. it's basically like a 10 minute drive from here, all these churches, all this history, little Africa, you know, the old courthouse, all these historical landmarks that maybe I, maybe I missed class that day. I don't know, but you know, I don't, I, I don't think, like, I don't recall ever learning these things. So um, I'm sure things are different now, hopefully, but I definitely want to see more visibility around the type of history that is happening in our region and the type of work that people are doing even now in this time. So, you know, that's one thing that I want to see. And furthermore, um, I also want to see more about, you know, Black joy. I think, you know, like I said, I think it's important for us to look in the past because that's where our answers are. That's where we find answers. But I also, you know, the looking into the past or, you know, with the constant focus on Black trauma and Black struggle, um, you know, let's mix it up a little bit. You know, of course, our, our past does have an element of Black struggle and, and um, you know, just um, all of these I guess, negative components of our history, but I also want to talk about Black joy. I want to talk about Black art. I want to talk about our culture. You know, let's talk about how amazing African culture is, how amazing our food is, our clothes, our celebrations, you know, all these things. Let's bring light to this, you know, instead of always, you know, I'm not saying we should stop talking about slavery. We should always talk about, you know, all these elements, but let's, let's celebrate, you know, let's celebrate what we have. Let's celebrate, you know, the amazing things that we do. And that's one thing that I want to see happening in the future is definitely just all around more celebration, more people learning about our culture, learning about Blackness and, and African heritage as, as a whole without having the focus beyond Black trauma and brutality. 100%. I couldn't agree more. And I think uh, we probably both missed class that day where they were Maybe. teaching <laughs> Black I, History I Month in school. <laughs> but I, I completely agree with everything you said. And I just think that even having these spaces to bring awareness to all the amazing contributions that our Black community brings to our country and to our community here in Niagara to make it diverse and prosperous and continue to advance uh, this, this area, right, from the beginning, from the beginning of times of slavery. Um, so I think that that's really what we should be acknowledging, that resilience and, and the strength that the Black community has showed throughout the years and continues to show. Um, and even from the conversations that we've had this evening, we've kind of talked about these themes of freedom and liberation and that they've traditionally looked like securing employment or possibly having land ownership. But over the years, we've seen that these definitions have drastically evolved. 
how do you envision that the definitions of freedom and liberation will look like for our Black community moving forward in the future? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and honestly, um, I like I said, you know, I still think that some of these issues still remain the same. It's just the fact that the only thing that's changed is the face. You know, it's just someone else that's carrying the mantle now and, you know, and, and things like that. So, of course, you know, we still face racism in our society when it comes to employment and land ownership and basically everything else. But, you know, now that now that that's covered, you know, I think to kind of continue on, one thing that I really want to see is just liberation from, you know, expectations, from, you know, being dehumanized. I remember, you know, Sherry, her interview really uh, spoke to me when she was talking about the death of Trayvon Martin. Trayvon Martin um, really impacted me um, during that time. His death was really was really horrible and brutal and ongoing. We had Mike Brown and then we had Sandra Bland and then we had... Um, Oscar Grant and just so many other people continue on, read just Korchinski packet, like there's so many continuations of, of, of black people being brutalized in so many ways. And that to me is like a first death. And then the second death that comes about is the gaslighting that occurs from people trying to justify their death, people trying to say, oh, you know, they they did this, they stole from a store when they're two years old. That's an exaggeration, but you know what I mean? People will just try to find things you know, to try to justify their death. And then, you know, what as a result of that, what we find, or at least for me, how we, you know, I'm sure uh, you, we had a conversation before about Im immigrants and immigrant parents, you know, and just kind of the old fashioned way of parenting is that people would say, you know what, the only way that we can be able to have our lives valued is if we do something valuable in society, you know, let's try to aim to be, you know, doctors and, and lawyers and aerospace engineers and presidents and all these things. And when we emulate those values, people will finally value Black people and Black lives. You know, people were saying, you know, oh, Trayvon Martin wanted to be an aerospace engineer. You know, people would say, you know, uh, uh, when people brutalize, you know, any type of Black person, they would say this person could have been a teacher. This person was, insert, socially acceptable career. And right. to be honest with you, I just want to be liberated from all those standards. I just want people to just, you know, value us because we're human beings you know i don't want i don't want to have to you know god forbid something bad happens to me i don't want people saying or me people saying oh she was so nice she was an anti racism advisor she did so much for the community you know i think the by, by bottom line bare minimum is that i'm a human being you know and i shouldn't be brutalized i shouldn't be killed because i'm a human being that's it you know so i like i said i'm not trying to speak for other people i'm just kind of you know speaking my personal opinion but i just want to be liberated from the idea that we have to somehow achieve some sort of excellence so that we can be valued in society. I just want us to be valued because we're human beings. You know, that should just be the bare minimum. We shouldn't have to try to find ways to justify why we shouldn't be brutalized, you know? So, and that's obviously been an ongoing thing. This is not something that's new, you know, black people have been brutalized in so many ways, lynching, you know, Sherry mentioned as well, and just overall, just dehumanization and disrespect for our lives. And yes. we've, had to sit here and be like, you know what? Let's try to become basketball players. Let's try to become presidents. Even basketball players and presidents face racism and discrimination. So, That's right. you know, I think at some point we just need to re rearrange the conversation and say, you know what? Don't treat people negatively or treat people with respect because they're humans. You know, that's just all it needs to be. That's the type of liberation that I want to see in the future where, you know, we don't have to sit here and worry about, you know, our status or our class or our career for us to be treated right we should just be treated right because we're human that's that's really the type of that's that's what liberation looks like to me of course and i i couldn't agree more i think the points that you made about the value of human life and and how those those traditional definitions they've actually still kind of carried throughout the years and uh, we're here and and we're still having these conversations about why black communities and black people shouldn't be brutalized and and sharing their value and and all of the contributions that they bring to the table but at the end of the day uh it's a human life and i think that that's really what we're speaking to here and and celebrating that black people are so much more than just the contributions that they bring uh they are worthy uh just by being human like you're saying so thank you so much eve for having this chat with us this evening and uh, taking time to come out for our event. We're so happy that you came and and thank you. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for this amazing event. And I just wanna thank everyone else, all the speakers who are here as well. Amazing work and just keep it up, keep up the good fights. <laughs> Lovely, well, we'll see you later Eve and take care.
Thank you so much to Eve for that amazing conversation around Black future. And thank you all for joining us this evening for our Black History and African Heritage Month celebration. To close off tonight's spectacular programming, please enjoy this cover song of Zion Train by Bob Marley and the Wailers, performed by the ever-talented, exceptional, and brilliant Eve Adams. Thank you once again, and let us not forget our transitions through time and to celebrate the resiliency, courage, and strength of past, present, and future generations of Black people, together united in solidarity, honoring our Black community in February and forever. Good night, everyone. Oh,